Hello, I'm Phyllis Auric, and I'm delighted to have a chance to contribute to the UC Santa Cruz Dickens Project, Dickens to Go, during the 2020 pandemic. I'm coming to you from Berkeley, California, although I most recently worked in academia as a researcher and editor. Like Dickens, I started my working life as a newspaper reporter. Since I retired six years ago from UC Berkeley, I have embarked on, on reading all of Dickens' 14 novels in chronological order, along the way pulling out passages and grouping them according to some two dozen subjects, among them the city and urban life, hotels and taverns, the countryside, money and its corrupting influence, religion and hypocrisy, and simply poetry, to name a few. I plan to use them as building blocks for my own writing. I've completed this work on the first seven novels, stopping at David Copperfield, which will be up next. I was inspired to do this by two circumstances that occurred nearly 30 years apart. The first was the gift by someone dear and near to me of a complete set of Dickens after I was promoted. The second was the receipt of a dozen or so letters written by my mother, Ruth, these letters awaken memories of my mother's way of speaking and how she would often weave in illusions of a Dickensian or a Victorian or Edwardian nature. The shoemaker's children shall have no shoes, was something I heard often. Or, as she and I headed off to shop for groceries and other household necessities, getting and spending, we lay waste our hours. Shakespeare, I know, but it has a Dickensian ring to me. It's been decades since she died, so it was a nice reawakening. My father, too, had an Edwardian Victorian sensibility. On the wall of his tiny den at home hung a porcelain bas relief depiction, about six inches wide and four high, of a man reclining in his chair, legs crossed elegantly at a huge desk, looking out over a country landscape, inscribed with the title Charles Dickens in His Study. For this Dickens to go, I've chosen the Pickwick Papers, the first long fiction Dickens wrote, for a number of reasons. In it, Dickens established most of the themes and figures that he would explore throughout his later works. And it shows Dickens the author progressing from a standoffish observer of Samuel Pickwick and his three pals to a true friend of his creations, for whom by the book's end he clearly feels deep affection. The posthumous papers of the Pickwick Club, to honor it with its full title, also display some metafictional playfulness that goes beyond the typical Victorian narrator who was so eager to get his point across that he peeks through the gap in the narrative curtains and speaks directly to the reader. As the ultimate narrative intrusion, Dickens pretends the entire story as a posthumous report. In Pickwick, Dickens creates what I see as a self-portrait of him at his best, this coming near the book's conclusion, when all the threads are tidied up and the good go to their rewards, the redeemable evildoers evil mend their ways, and the few irredeemable transgressors are allowed to fade from sight. This first passage I assigned to the poetry category though Dickens's intimate knowledge of the city shines through here as well. It has a particular appeal to me, the sheer joy and exuberance of a pretty morning with nothing much official to be done, but lots of potential adventures of a gentle sort. It reminds me of Joyce's opening of Ulysses. You can find it at the start of chapter two, which is on page six of my edition. That punctual servant of all work, the sun, had just risen and begun to strike a light on the 13th of May, 1827, when Mr. Samuel Pickwick burst like another sun from his slumbers, threw open his chamber window, and looked out upon the world beneath. Goswell Street was at his feet. Goswell Street was on his right hand as far as the eye could reach. Goswell Street extended on his left and the opposite side. Of Goswell Street was over the way. Such, thought Mr. Pickwick, are the narrow views of those philosophers who, content with examining the things that lie before them, 
Look not to the truths which are hidden beyond. As well might I be content to gaze on Goswell Street forever, without one effort to penetrate to the hidden countries which on every side surround it. And having given vent to this beautiful reflection, Mr. Pickwick proceeded to put himself into his clothes, and his clothes into his portmanteau. Great men are seldom over-scrupulous in the arrangement of their attire. The operation of shaving, dressing, and coffee imbibing was soon performed. And in another hour, Mr. Pickwick, with his portmanteau in his hand, his telescope in his great coat pocket, and his notebook on his waistcoat, ready for the reception of any discoveries worthy of being noted down, had arrived at the coach stand in St. Martin's Le Grand. This next passage is one of the most amusing narrative asides, and it occurs at the start of chapter 13, on page 161 of my edition. It happens on the occasion of the Pickwickians visiting the town of Eatonswill in the midst of a hotly contested election. As someone who covered the intensely local, almost parochial politics of Baltimore, I found the scenes familiar, but this passage falls under the narrative technique category that I created. We will frankly acknowledge that up to the period of our being first immersed in the voluminous papers of the Pickwick Club, we had never heard of Eaton's will. We will, with equal contour, admit that we have in vain searched for proof of the actual existence of such a place at the present day. Knowing the deep reliance we placed on every note and statement of Mr. Pickwick's and not presuming to set up our recollection against the recorded declarations of that great man, we have consulted every authority bearing upon the subject to which we could possibly refer. We have traced every name and schedules A and B without meeting that of Eaton's will. We have minutely examined every corner of the pocket county maps issued for the benefit of society by our distinguished publishers, and the same result has attended our investigation. We are therefore led to believe that Mr. Pickwick, with that anxious desire to abstain from giving offense to any, and with those delicate feelings for which all who knew him well were eminently remark remarkable, purposely substituted a fictitious designation for the real name of the place in which his observations were made. We are confirmed in this belief by a little circumstance, apparently slight and trivial in itself, but when considered in this point of view, not undeserving of notice. In Mr. Pickwick's notebook, we can just trace an entry of the fact that the places of himself and his followers were booked by the Norwich coach, but this entry was afterwards lined through as if for the purpose of concealing even the direction in which the borough is situated. We will not therefore hazard a guess upon the subject, but will at once proceed with this history, content with the materials which its characters have provided for us. Finally, the third passage is one in which I believe Dickens reveals himself as the way he would want to be thought of. It occurs at the beginning of chapter 56, when Pickwick declares he is done with his rambles. All the changes that have taken place among us, said Mr. Pickwick, I mean the marriage that has taken place and the marriage that will take place with the changes they involve, rendered it necessary for me to think soberly and at once upon my future plans. I determined on retiring to some quiet, pretty neighborhood in the vicinity of London. I saw a house which exactly suited my fancy. I have taken it and furnished it. It is fully prepared for my reception, and I intend entering it at once, trusting that I may live yet to spend many quiet years in peaceful retirement, cheered through life by the society of my friends, and followed in death by their affectionate remembrance. Here Mr. Pickwick paused, and a low murmur ran round the table. The house I have taken, said Mr. Pickwick, is at Dulwich. It has a large garden and is situated in one of the most pleasant spots of London. It has been fitted up with every attention to substantial comfort, perhaps to a little elegance besides, but of that you shall judge for yourselves. Sam accompanies me there. I have engaged on Perker's representation a housekeeper, a very old one, and such other servants as she thinks I shall require. I propose to consecrate this little retreat by having a ceremony in which I take a great interest 
performed there. I wish, if my friend Wattle entertains no objection, that his daughter should be married from my new house on the day I take possession of it. The happiness of young people, said Mr. Pickwick, that moved, has ever been the chief pleasure of my life. It will warm my heart to witness the happiness of those friends who are dearest to me beneath my own roof. Mr. Pickwick paused again, and Emily and Arabella sobbed audibly. I've communicated both personally and by letter with the club, resumed Mr. Pickwick, acquainting them with my intention. During our long absence, it has suffered much from internal dissensions, and the withdrawal of my name, coupled with this and other circumstances, has occasioned its dissolution. The Pickwick Club exists no longer. I shall never regret, said Mr. Pickwick in a low voice, I shall never regret having devoted the greater part of two years to mixing with different varieties and shades of human character. Frivolous as my pursuit of novelty may have appeared to many, nearly the whole of my previous life having been devoted to business and the pursuit of wealth, numerous scenes of which I had no previous conception have dawned upon me. I hope to the enlargement of my mind and the improvement of my understanding. If I have done but little good, I trust I have done less harm, and that none of my adventures will be other than a source of amusing and pleasant recollections to me in the decline of life. God bless you all. With these words, Mr. Pickwick filled and drained a bumper with a trembling hand, and his eyes moistened as his friends rose with one accord and pledged him from their hearts. Thank you for listening to my thoughts about the Pickwick Papers and Dickens, and I look forward to hearing from others for this project.